The scar's obviously in a better place, but you're shaking your head. So oh my god, it's a horrible operation. I, Bob, I, t please talk to me. Tell I me. only I, I, I only know one guy. He's over in Kansas that's doing it anymore. Really? Yeah. So they're abandoning under the armpit. It's a blind operation. How many uh, blind operations do you want? To I do zero blind operations. Hello, welcome to the Dr. Gill Show. This is the show where we talk about medical matters that matter to you. My guest today is Dr. Matt Concanon. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you here, Matt. Matt is a board certified plastic surgeon who did additional subspecialty training at Harvard Medical School just for hand surgery. That's a now, that's a fairly common thing for plastic surgeons to also tag on hand specialty, isn't it? It's fairly common? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know the stats across the country. I mean, clearly, I was uh, shaped or molded by my mentor, who was Lynn Puckett, uh -huh. and he was a hand surgeon, too. So we all wanted to emulate him. There are, I know there are plastic surgery programs where there really isn't as strong of a hand presence, uh -huh. uh, and uh, they don't. They don't have that mentorship and not following it. From my experience on the oral board examinations, I know that the amount of, you are tested on hand, but less and less uh -huh. in terms of just getting board certified. I see. So you have a, what I would call a general plastic surgery practice. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about plastic surgery. Plastic surgery, I guess back in the 70s was considered something for vanity or something that Hollywood people would do just to tune up their looks and there wasn't anything, uh, what was the word I'm looking for, morally uh, substantive to, to, to support it was just vanity, right? Well, certainly in the, in the, in the media, you know, that was, it was, all, it was all titillating, it's, you know, hush hush, they had work done, uh, whatever starlet or whatever, you know, breast surgery or whatnot. Right. Uh, but plastic surgery, to be fair, has its roots uh, in about 1915, World War I. Okay. Uh, actually, probably the fa one of the modern fathers of plastic surgery is a guy named Kazanjian, who, was, who went to Harvard Dental School. Huh. And he uh, served with the Harvard uh, Medical Unit in France uh, during World War I. And oh. he was dealing with all these massive facial injuries. Like, in so many ways, uh, World War I, World War II, Vietnam... Right. All these medical advances happen, so that's where plastic surgery was born. And so we, we start off with you know doing burns and and maxillofacial stuff. Okay. And then uh, it just sort of ex it expanded as it or it evolved. I guess is a better way of putting it. Yeah. So people need to understand that plastic surgery is not for vanity. Usually, um, it just changes people's lives. It's called plastic reconstructive surgery for a reason. We don't just, you don't just, just do moles or boobs or noses. You're taking care of burns. You're taking care of horrible injuries. You take, you're reconstructing people after cancer surgeries right. and whatnot. Right. And you're changing people's lives in very meaningful, profound ways. Yeah, yeah. And people should not look at plastic surgery as just a, a vanity thing, but something, what you say, that changes their life forever. Well, certainly there's, you know, there's... Uh... There's different categories within plastic surgery, like craniofacial, and, okay, and hand this part, yeah, for head and face, uh, cleft lip and palate would fall. Yeah, you that. see that on TV. It's a worldwide <clears throat> issue. Uh, hand surgery, uh, general reconstruction, which would maybe you know encompass breast reconstruction, uh, limb reconstruction, limb salvage, uh, oh. all that. All that falls under plastic surgery, and even oh. and even cosmetic. You know, so cosmetic would be equal in terms of a, a, of a bucket, you know, uh -huh. but and you could, you know, you could say, well, that's frivolous. But the, to your point, I think that you were saying, even these cosmetic uh, refinements or whatever can profoundly help someone's quality of life. I mean, it's not, sure. it's not frivolous and it's certainly not frivolous for the people that are considering it. It's typically a problem that they can't address any other way. Right. You know, it's something that bothers them, makes them feel very insecure, probably, or depending on what the issue is. And if it's something we can help, 
it's really gratifying. And those people, it is a, a life changing kind of experience. Good. So I'm glad we've cleared, cleared that up here. Um, I believe if I remember correctly, maybe one of the first plastic surgeries ever was thousands of years ago in India. They, one of, a punishment was to cut off the nose. Yeah. I remember seeing the thing where they would cut out a lollipop off the forehead, and transplant it, and then sew it up. And you could actually make a nose even 3,000 years ago. We still do that technique. But, but, ah! but, the, but I'll the, be darned. The first, one, the first ones was, I think it's Tagliacazzi, and an Italian surgeon who did a flap from the arm. From so the he, arm, yeah. He would, he would uh, sew the arm to the nose, or to where the nose was. And then, the, I think it's from India, they came up with this forehead flap. Which, which we still do. We still I'll use that. I'll be darned. I'll yeah. be darned. So uh, this is true in, all, in almost all areas of surgery. Surgeons uh, have areas that they like, that they get really good at and whatnot. Um, so in your practice, from what I understand, it's about 50% hands. Right. Which includes traumas. Yeah. And we've got tractors and mowers and snow blowers oh and auto accidents and ATVs, motorcycles. All kinds of limb injuries that happen. So about half of your practice is hand, and half of your practice is is more what we call cosmetic. Yeah, or that's that's pretty fair. So let's talk about the the usual cosmetic, the, the most common cosmetic surgeries that you perform. Okay, I went to your website and I saw that you uh, do some facial work, but it appears that most of the work you're doing is this mommy makeup. Right, and let's define that term, please. So mommy makeover is, doesn't really mean one thing. It typically means, well, in general, it's like restoring a lady after the ravages of pregnancy. Yes. Which, you know, and that could take a lot of different versions or looks. So it's typically a breast surgery, either a breast augmentation, a breast lift, or a breast reduction, depending on what the situation is. Gotcha. Combined with a tummy tuck. Yes. So... That's a mommy makeover. And, and for what it's worth, that's sort of almost a marketing term. I, mean, I, don't, sure. I don't do those operations at the same time. I, uh, do, I do them separately. Because it's, it's better recovery and fewer much, complications? Much easier recovery, far fewer uh, complications. I mean, it's just night and day. I mean, my, and, that's and, important to know, Matt, because I've seen people advertising, well, we do it all in one day. And, and that's a recipe for disaster, huh? Honestly, I mean, I. I that's how I was trained, you know, okay. and uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say some of the stuff that we would, you know, when I was in training, they would line up, you know, eight, nine hours of surgery. Whoa. That's not, that's not good. That's you know, tough on you too. It, it is. And, uh, but still, I, I don't want to be operating on any one person longer than two hours unless you have to. Unless blood so, clots, infection, all blood that stuff loss, goes, all, all these all things. All that goes straight up. Gotcha. Gotcha. So. You know, I'm an OBGYN by training, although I, you know, I'm a fertility doctor and surgeon at this point. But I tell you what, what women's bodies go through to have babies, the sacrifice right, right, right. they make is just amazing. And obviously we want to all want to look, well, maybe many of us want to look youthful and young and have the body of our, of our teenage years. But let's talk specifically about what you can do about these various Changes that happen in the body. Uh, another thing, let me share with you, Matt. Um, until recently, I did a lot of what are called annual exams. We had our ladies; they wanted to have babies, and we helped them have babies. Then they'd keep coming back for their annuals, hormone replacement, and all that kind of stuff. I've gotten too busy doing fertility to do that. So I had the opportunity to do a lot of physical exams on women who have been to plastic surgery. And I got to tell you. The amount of horrible scarring after breast surgery that I saw, in various, you know, I saw the results of you know, at least a dozen different plastic surgeons from here in the Midwest. The amount of scarring was just horrifying is, is the word. I mean, it might look good under clothing or in a brassiere or yeah. something, but there was this horrible scarring. And people need to realize also that the skin on the shoulders and the chest is thin. And it's already predisposed to scarring. So how do you approach breast surgery, Matt, to minimize the scarring, to maximize your, your, your good results? Well, uh, for a breast augmentation, for example, where okay. we're, we're putting in implants, okay. my incision is only four centimeters long. 
Now, there's, tell me if I'm wrong, there's three different places you can put it. You can put it under, around the nipple, mm -hmm. the areola. You can put it under here, that's inframammary. Right. And then you can make an incision in the armpit. Right. And there's so a tell me. technically, there, you, there's an old one, if you're using saline, where you go through the belly button. Through the belly button. I've, I've heard of that too. So there's yep. four ways you can yep. get underneath. Right. So tell me about those those approaches and why you do one or another. Well, I do all mine at the inframammary at the bottom. So okay. When I when I do that, it's only four centimeters long. Typically, it's hidden right in the crease there. You okay. Know? So it's not. You have to really kind of hang upside down to look at it. Sure. To be clear, anywhere I make an incision, there's always going to be a scar. There's always going to be a scar. No such thing as scarless surgery, but it's small. We close it with sutures on the inside. We're not making track marks for from the sutures. But I, I like that approach because when I'm taking that approach, I'm never even in the breast. I'm behind it the whole time. Ah. So I'm not messing with any nerves. So I'm not messing with any ducts. And I like that. I don't like right. messing with the breast any more than I have to, the, the, the organ of the breast. Right. So that, and it gets me right where I need to be. It, so okay. it's, it's right there getting under that muscle or right over that muscle, depending uh -huh. on the technique. So that's the breast augmentation. Okay. Uh, while we're here, can we talk real quickly about saline, which is salt water, mm -hmm. and silicone? Can you tell me pros and cons of saline and, and silicone? Let me let me actually bring you through like a history of impact. I would silicone. love that. I would love that. So I can, you know, back in the day. So first of all, when they figured it out, I mean, there was that David Schwimmer movie, I think, about the the guy that came up with the idea of breast implants. I mean, it's on HBO or something, but yeah. it's been, it's not really a, that's not really the true story, but. They thought of silicone gel implants and uh, maybe 10 years before I started training and, or a little bit or thereabouts. I mean, the first implants they were putting on, they could only do like 90 cc implants, which sounds crazy small, but they weren't releasing the muscle. They were trying to get under the muscle, but not releasing the muscle. Under the muscle. So anyway, there was silicone gel. And then by the time I get on the scene. In an envelope, in, in, in a yes, container. Yes. Uh, in a plastic bag, as it were. That's a really good analogy, it's, okay. it, but it's also a silicone kind of polymer, I guess. All right. But those early containers, those early, uh, uh, I can't think of the name, but th those early implants, they made those, the shell, they made the shell, okay. they made the shell really thin so they'd be softer, but they were so thin, they were actually porous to the silicone. So, I mean, so you could feel it would leak yeah. slowly. Well, it's 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 not like leaking out like if I spilled this but cup. It would ooze, but, maybe. Well, a little bit, a right. little bit would ooze out. And uh, now this is in retrospect. You know, our big problem at the time was like we would get something called capsular contracture. Okay. It was almost a hundred percent. The uh, earliest scientific papers I ever authored or co-authored uh -huh. were on this topic, trying to figure uh, out what to do about it. So. Um, Anyway, uh, with the, uh, let me think for a second. That was the problem. Oh, let me, so we would put in anything in the body. You put it, whether it's a breast implant or a pacemaker or an artificial knee or anything, mm -hmm. your body forms a scar around it. It walls it off. And that is the capsule. That's a normal thing after, after breast surgery or anything. So we, and that capsule is what holds that implant in place. That's why ah, it doesn't move around. So you need some of that. No, no, you have to have a. You, you have to have everyone some has tissue a capsule, reaction. and it's it's just basically scar. But capsular contracture is when that that scar kind of shrinks up. The myofibroblast, sure, and it, it, you know the shortest, the smallest uh, surface area of that is going to be a globe. A sphere. Yeah. So it is in, the, in its worst cases, they're 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 misshapen, they're extremely painful. And that was the big problem, capsular contracture. And even before that, weren't they injecting silicone directly into the breast? Wasn't that a disaster for a few years? I don't know that medically that was ever. Now, it's been done in garages in Florida. Right, 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 right. But I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I, but I can't speak for Okay, so that wasn't an official sanctioned procedure. Not but I know I'm women not. did have... Silicone directly injected, and then they'd have mastectomies. Oh, it's horrible. horrible. It's horrible. Right. I've seen I've seen cases of people that had injected in their face or in their butt. I know people are injecting Vaseline oh, yeah. and yeah. stuff into their bodies. Horrible, now. horrible. So you need a, you need to have it controlled in a bag of some sort. <laughs> right. So okay. So anyway, so back back to the to the eighties, we're dealing with, with and they're coming up with all these different kind of implants trying to solve this problem. They have textured implants, and they had this one. This is kind of funny. 
they, the, the one that was very popular for a while is polyurethane cover, huh. which had like a, 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 a textured cover. And man, that was, it seemed like that was going to solve the problem. That, those people went two years, three years, didn't have capsular contracture. They looked great. Okay. However, the body breaks, breaks down the polyurethane, and it turns out that what it breaks it down to is carcinogenic. And sulfur containing. Yeah, right? yes, poison. So, and then once that outer coating is gone, then they got capsular contraction. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just sort of taking you through the history of this. Sure. Now, we always had saline back in the day, but saline wasn't as popular as silicone gel, at least in the circles that I, in most, in most circles. Not all, but some. And uh, saline, you could have issues like rippling of the skin and, and other, and it didn't feel as natural. Right, it's not as natural feel. <clears throat> so then in the, in the 90s, uh, I don't remember the guy named Kessler in charge of the FDA. Fred Kessler. Fred Kessler. He, he, was, he was the guy who was, thanks to him, he was great. We can now see on food labels, grams of protein, grams of, I mean, yeah, everything right. has food labels, right. calories, is because it was, a gene, it was a great move, and he was looking for his next big win. And he goes, you know what? No one's really looked at silicone gel implants. And so the FDA in 94, I don't remember the exact time. They, they did a uh, moratorium on silicone gel breast implants. And it's basically saying, we want more study before you can do more of these. Now, hold on. The FDA, they have risk benefit. Sure. So breast cancer patients, they go, well, there's a benefit because of, you know, self-esteem or whatnot. Of it's a more natural a breast when you well, do that. Yeah. After after mastectomy, it's reconstructive. Right. So, so that can accept more risk. So... So we could always put silicone gel. Throughout this whole time, we could put silicone gel in our breast cancer patients. Gotcha. But cosmetic patients, the FDA said, in their infinite wisdom, there's no benefit, which I would argue with. So that, that has to equal no risk or less risk. Right, right. So the moratorium was only on cosmetic patients. So what happened was, until 2007 then, we only had saline augmentation that, that, we, could, that we could use. So the number of, uh, it feels like the number of augmentations went down and then it started trending back up. And um, one thing I noticed, and this was fascinating to me, was silicone uh, saline has its issues, but I didn't see a single case of capsule contraction. With saline. With saline. In the modern capsule. So, so, so yeah. then, bump up to 2007, and uh, they, the FDA got, I mean, entire countries weighed in on this. The Academy of Rheumatology or whatever. Oh, yes. right. Because yeah. they, people think they have autoimmune conditions. Arthritis that was the accusation. And whatnot. That was the accusation. Uh, the, uh, Due to the poison. Yeah. And, and so Allegedly. in 2007, they said, okay, it's fine. Everyone can use them. And it says, now the implants had changed by then. They made a thicker shell. Okay. Right. It's not uh, osmosing through. And since 2007, our incidence of capsular contracture has been, I mean, mine's been under two, three, four percent. Fantastic. So there's been an improvement in the actual silicon implant. But, and you consider them safe now? Oh, my God. And I would feel I'm, much more natural? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, would, I, I would put them happily in members of my own family. So. Okay. Uh, there you go. That's what you want to hear. Well, that's doctor. how you should always approach everything. Is right. what, how would I feel if my mom was having this done? Right. You know, what, yeah. Or, or yeah. my daughter. Right. You know, so, or, or my wife or son or whatever. Right. So, in summary, you can put them in and you can do breast work with minimal scarring. And the new silicon implants are much, much safer. And people are generally happy with that. Well, I mean, I, safer. I mean, we have less problems with it. I mean, okay. capsule contracture, I mean, it was a pain, but it's not really a health thing. But it's certainly, a, it's, it's not a good, you don't want it. You don't want it. Okay. Now. Sometimes there's a, there's a young woman walking in a, in a, a small top, and you can tell she's got implants. She's got the ledge. You know, the joke is you could, you, you could put a beer on there. You know. What do you do to make them natural looking? Man? First of all, I tell my patients, because at, 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 at some point in the interview, we spend about an hour just talking, and we have a meeting. Uh, almost universally, the, the ladies will say, I want to look natural. Right. And I say, I hear that nonstop. It's because I practice in Columbia, Missouri, not in L.A. 
Right. But, and, I, and I said, okay, let's, let's talk about non-natural. Okay. And I always use the same uh, uh, person, I, I, uh, Pamela Anderson. Pamela. I, now, my patient clientele is getting younger. And I'm going to have to find a, a younger person that they can be like, like tattoos Ooh. and piercings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they don't know her. But, uh, <laughs> right. but anyway, I said, like, okay, so we can agree that's like two bolted on melons, right? So that's right. not natural. The, the higher we go with the implant, the more likely you're going to have a look like that. In the volume, in the size. That's it. This is a straight line correlation. And you measure it. this in cc's, right? Yeah, yeah. What's an average implant? 200, 300 cc's? You know, I don't, I mean, it's going to be a bell-shaped curve. Depending be, on what, on your desired result. But, but what would be, I just want to get some idea when you're talking CCs. If somebody had a 500 CC. Probably the most common, the most common that I, I use is around the 300 range. Around 300, okay, good. So if somebody has 1,000 CCs and you're, you're, you're. They don't even make those anymore. They don't even make, oh, good. No. Good. Hey, back in the day, back in the day when, when this was, a, when Columbia was one stripper town, Right. Yeah, yeah. There was, it, that was when I was a student. I have a couple of clients. Doctor Puckett. Doctor. There was one stripper. I won't say her name. Uh, but uh, but she he had custom implants made for her, and you know so he shipped off the dial and dial the now defunct dial that got killed in the in all the uh, lawsuits. All the lawsuits about silicone. Oh, Dow, D O W. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Co chemical company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and anyway, that they would. Uh, they would manufacture them and send them off, and, and he put them in. Okay. But, but, but we, she, was expected, she was expecting to look like that. Right, right, right. So right. we've ever, okay, so let's get back to making them look natural on that. The, well, there's one other thing. So along with the, the volume of the implant, the other part of that equation is how much soft tissue coverage do they have already to start with. Okay. And this is why we will often go under the muscle. Because that Under don't, this pectoral muscle under here. The pectoral muscle, yeah. There is room under here, huh? Well, no. Not exactly. So the pec comes from the arm okay. all the way to the sternum and along down here. Okay. So we cut it like this and raise the muscle up. You actually cut the muscle insertion? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It stays It stays the Origin, insertion. whatever that would be. Yeah. I don't know which is the origin or which right, is the right, insertion. Right, 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 right. I think it's the origin insertion. But anyway. But, uh, but we, it stays connected. So, they so still have that function. So that's how you get under the muscle. You're not coming in here. Because I'm, I'm thinking it's going to make the breast come off here. If you're coming in here, so you're coming under here, right, 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 right. We're, uh, go, we're going under. under your inframammary. Another exactly. reason to start there, right? Okay. Um, so you can get this implant under the muscle, made of silicone, not too big, and you can get a very natural looking breast. Correct. Now the downside of going under the muscle, and, and under the muscle is the most common. Ninety-five percent of the time, we're going under the muscle. Really? There's a very specific group of patients. I'll go over the muscle deliberately. But, um, but the downside is anytime they fire their pec, they're going to animate a little bit. Sort of like, I tell them it's like the rock doing no, Yeah, yeah, muscle dance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but they can still do some bench presses. They and, can do all and, that and, stuff. And, and swim. And it's yeah. not going to impede uh, function that much. At three weeks after surgery, I tell them they get skydive. There you go. Which I love it. It means anything. They can do. Now, how about these lollipop scars and anchor scars? And as they see when they've had these big lifts, and it's just it's just scar everywhere. That's the yeah. only way. Sometimes, if you're going to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. So, okay. Off the, a, a common scenario for me is a lady will come in and she'll have a lot of ptosis or droop, right. and she's here for more volume. Like, right? well, first of all, I can't put an I can't put an implant in like that. Because when I put an implant in, I have no saying where it goes. It has to go right behind the nipple. Right. And then the breasts are still going to be toasted. Well, if, I, if I put it up here, then the nipple's going to be even worse. Right, right, right. Or, so we need or, a, you want to back up where it was. Or you can have like a rocks and socks kind of thing, right? That doesn't sound good. No. So, so the lift, the reason for those scars, I could draw it. Uh -huh. But, but uh, basically, it's a way to hide the scars as much as possible. Got it. And... Uh, if you want, I can I can draw it. I would love that, man. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wipe off your your medical school and residency right. training, and let's see if we can have an actual all right an actual drawing here so for our audience at home. Okay. I will. Explain I will. Explain it. If I hold this up like that, and hold it to there, maybe, 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 like, like 
So yeah. if this is sort of a, a, a totic breast, what I do when I make my mark is I mark where I want the nipple to be at the apex. I, I measure. Okay. And so then I'll make some planning marks that look like this. Okay, so you've made some, you've drawn around where the nipple and the areola will go. Sometimes I'll also make a, oftentimes the areola is a little stretched out. So I'll make a, I'll make a mark like this on the inside. So you'll lose a little bit of the areola, you'll make it a little smaller. Yeah, well that's a good thing. Okay. I mean, it, it, when they're real wide. So I, all I do, the first move is I just take away this skin. Okay, that's and it's stretched out. And it's just the skin. So this nipple that remains, a lot of patients are hearing, nipple gets cut off, gets put back on. That's not what happens. So it is still on the gland. You, I think you called it the organ of the breast. Right, It's right. maintained. So right. the breast has the nipple, it has the ducts, it has the glands underneath. That's not being cut. Correct. Okay. So anyone who has this operation, for all intents and purposes, should they want to breastfeed afterwards, could. The plumbing possible. is still. Right, right. And so this, this, mo this nipple gets mobilized up to here. It's easy to see where that's going. Right. Th this line meets up with this line, which right. leaves us with... Yeah, for our folks at home, it looks like a, a, a keyhole almost, and then it turns into what we call an anchor, a lollipop and anchor scar. So this is the nipple going up here. Right. This line is this line. Right. And then out here. And this is the same scar for both a breast lift and a breast reduction. The difference, ah. the difference between those two operations is on a breast lift, once I do this, I'm, all I got to do is close. Okay. On a reduction, then I got to go through and take away excess breast tissue until we're done taking away breast tissue. So, okay. So and then much and bigger. So a lift is very different, well, very much less severe, let's say, than a lift. They're actually pretty, no, a, a lift is pretty close to a reduction. Okay. The only difference is in the reduction, we're taking out some breast tissue too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's very, very helpful, man. Thank you. Now, something I've, I've noticed in, in the various plastic surgeons' work I see. Some of them leave very thin, small scars, and some have these horrible, thick, just, just I don't even know how to describe them, almost keloid scars. They're thick and they're discolored. What do, you, what do you do? And this is more of a surgeon asking another surgeon, what's your technique for keeping those scars very nice? Because I, I don't know if I said earlier, you do some of the best, best, best breast work I've seen and, and keeping those scars small. How do you do that? Well, tell you what, I'm still learning. I just got a new tip from one Nothing of the guys wrong. I trained. Nothing like, wrong with that. Like three weeks ago. Shout out to Dr. Stephen Craig. Um, he, uh, first of all, we close, all, all the sutures are on the inside. Right. We do several layers of dissolvable stitches. Um, and so there's no track marks like that. You see, right. Like, no staples, sutures. anything like that. Uh, but uh, we'll support the incisions too. And, and the thing that he taught me, or we're trying now, yeah. he puts tape on his incisions for two months. Paper tape, ah. and and so we start with a stereo strip, like a inch wide stereo strip, and then when that comes off, okay. we, I send the patients home with a roll of paper tape. And as like, when it starts to peel off, just take it off and put it on one. So on. it keeps the tension off of that closure yeah. while it's healing. Now, as much as every right. surgeon would like to take full credit or blame, you right. know, there are intrinsic things that are going on that we don't fully understand. And they're genetic. Some women are gonna. Some people are gonna scar some more of it, than others. Some of it's right? genetic. Some of it's uh, geographical on the patient. Ah, huh. like this is a horrible place for scarring. This is yeah. almost universal. Shoulders terrible. Sternum is horrible. Yeah, pre. The back yeah. is really bad because the dermis is so thick. Uh, ah. Eyelids have. I mean, it's like paper thin. You can't really see a scar there. Ah, it's because I, of the dermal thickness. I see. So, um, but like you know, people are are real keen on wanting to minimize their scars as much as possible to sure. what's that uh mederma or whatever the the scar cream it's just over the counter it's, it's got a lot of uh uh product recognition but okay. I, I i tell my patients once they're healed you know they ask about scar creams or whatever i'm like <clears throat> you know um there's not really any data you know um so i tell the most important thing that you can do to make that scar look better is Step into a time machine and wait six months. All and right. That, 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 and, and I said, I used a joke. You could rub pat, cat poop on it right. for six months and say, look what, look what just made it look better. Right. And it's cat, time. It's the time. Yeah. Well, as a surgeon, I think this is real important. Um, how about, I've heard that sun exposure while it's healing will make it dark. For the first year. Yeah. Ah. While it's pink. So 
the scar while it's pink is still maturing. And that's how you can that's how you can gauge how mature the scar is by the color. Okay. Young people scar more exuberantly and are more prone to hypertrophic scarring. Us old people don't scar as exuberantly and we tend to have great looking scars. Interesting. It's just yeah, so a be- uh, finally a benefit of getting older. One of them. So <laughs> even though I'm a big proponent of getting sunlight, you got to keep those scars covered while they're healing for the first year. Or they're hop- they they will hyperpigment. I've seen they it. They will happen. get dark and stay dark. They stay dark. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. So how about the approaching the breast through the through the armpit? I mean, the scar is obviously in a better place, but you're shaking your head. So oh my god, that's a horrible operation. I, I, to, please talk to me. Tell I me. only I, I, I only know one guy. He's over in Kansas that's doing it anymore. Really? Yeah. So they're abandoning under the armpit. It's a blind operation. How many blind uh, operations do you want? I do zero blind operations. Literally, I mean, I mean, I have a friend who was doing them. And it's bas- it's, uh, all I know is what I was told, because I've never even okay. done one. But it's, you, you make that incision, it's, you are releasing the muscle blindly. You're tunneling in there blindly. Blindly. And then literally, they're like, just irrigate until it's clear. Now, I can tell you, doing it under direct vision, I've had some massive bleeders at times. Right, you, know? you hit a bleeder. The arteries are where you don't expect them. So and you've got a tunnel and you can't fix a bleeder. I, I don't do blind. And the other thing is, um, high incidence, it feels like, a uh, high incidence of mis, uh, misplaced implants. Right, they're not where you want them. Well, if you don't That's come with so the muscle, it will do like you said. It'll yeah, be you get the, the east-west of phenomena. Yeah. Oh, that's very helpful, Matt. Very helpful. Yeah, so in summary about breast, it ain't easy. You need a, a surgeon with a lot of experience. And for a lift or a, a reduction, you're going to have a, generally an anchor Lollipop you, scar. Yeah, that, and that's, I, I, I it's, it's probably one of the most common scenarios that we see of, of people that come in for like breast implants and they're like disappointed because it's a, it's a, it's, it's a deal breaker. You know, they don't want that scar. I'm like, we just can't help it. There's no other way to, to do that. And if you don't go too big, you won't get the ledge up top and have right, the, right, for abnormal. sure. Well, I just learned a lot about breast, man. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the other, if we're talking mommy makeovers, baby grows in the tummy. I still can't. I delivered a 1,000 babies in my training. I don't do it anymore. <laughs> I still can't believe women do it in lift. It, it, just the trauma, the, yeah. the ability of the, of the female body to hold this enormous baby, have it leave the body generally without killing it, um, is just amazing. So the belly gets stretched out, takes a toll, and it's not just the skin, is it? Matt? Well, right, the muscles get pushed apart. So it's all these layers. So you've got your six-pack muscles here, your, 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 uh, your erectors here, but they split apart, don't they? It's yeah. called a diastasis. Yeah, diastasis recti. Right, right. So it's more than just saggy skin when you're talking about a, a, a saggy belly after a few babies. Right, right. So tell me more about that. Well, again, I have a visual. I can do it. I am just loving this, Matt. I'm going to erase the board. I'm this is like a vir- this is like a virtual constellation because this is what uh, I draw well, every time when well, I do a constellation. That's great. That's great. So we have a marker. We have a whiteboard. Let's talk about the belly. All right. Um. So an- another thing I- I've 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 seen, Matt. I have women come to me want to get pregnant. They've had a couple babies and they've already had a tummy tuck. And it seems to me that's the wrong order. You should have your tummy tuck after you're having yeah, done. Yeah, you should. After you're having babies. Because that can, that can undo. Well, it's, I wouldn't say it's not, you can get pregnant after it. Yeah. It's not going to hurt you, but it, will, it might mess up where you are. And I want to put a finer point on breast surgery. I see some women have breast surgery and then lose weight rather than lose weight and then have the breast surgery. And... It seems to me that if you're going to have a, a breast reduction or something, you should have it once you've, once you've lost your De- weight. Depending on how much weight you're talking about. I mean, if you're talking about 15. It's a lot. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, talking to, I'm talking 50, 100 pounds. Definitely. You should, you should get you your weight first. Yeah, I wanted to, to go back on that because I see women having, they're, they're overweight, their breasts have gotten very large, they have the surgery, and then they lose the weight, and then they're back down to. The message that I tell my patients is, lose. you know, when we're talking about it, if you're losing weight, I say, like, okay. If weight loss is in your future, right? I mean, if it's not, it's not. It it's not, be, right, right. But if weight loss is in your future, the more weight you lose, the better job I can do. And it's exactly. a, another straight line correlation. You yeah. can look at my website 
and you know there's a, there's a whole category of, of massive weight loss patients you know yes the bariatric surgery and I'm seeing more and more people that's you know diet and exercise 100 115 pounds it's great yeah I lost 130 pounds I know yeah. I know that's pretty good but so yeah. um uh that's the message because the more that it's just about the excess skin and not skin and fat mm. the re I mean you can see the results it just it's just amazing yeah, yeah. So now I just wanted to put that finer point on, on when to have breast surgery. So let's just say that this is our hypothetical patient, and she, let's just say this is a C-section scar. Sure. Or 40% of women deliver via C-section. So yeah, that's a C-section scar, or that's the, the, the point where they're, she's folding over some excess skin like that. You know, so okay, it's, it's, it's called a panis or paniculus. What's the word you well, use? Well, I, mean, I think the apron, people come down in the apron. apron. All right. It seems right. a little severe to call it. But All right. So let's say the pooch. Pooch. Yeah. There All we right. go. Anyway, so my incision on a tummy tuck, and I'll, later I'll sort of tell you about sort of how we have it set up in terms of doing it in our office. Oh, okay. We have a fully credit office OR, and that's what revolutionized a lot of our stuff. Gotcha. But so my incision is going to be table to table. So it goes from hip to hip. So you, you're drawing a large horizontal somewhat curvy incision from right. the, from the top of the hip bones here the hip spines all the way across through right. now, do you go through that uh, that fold i i go right underneath it right underneath so, so you don't want to be exactly in the fold no, that's where the no. bacteria live well and get infected i'm not worried about that i'm more worried about how the skin lines up okay so um but so anyway uh we make that incision and, and there have been discussions like well can you make the scar less can make it smaller and the answer is the less this is the more this is about skin and right. by getting rid of skin so the less incision i make the less skin i'm taking out which is the less uh results we're going to have right so so then i go to macy's i go all the way down to the muscles this is usually about this thick okay and then i start heading north all right. and i'm raising up the skin and fat and we'll blow past the belly button we'll release it from the skin there but it stays connected on the inside because the belly button, people need to realize, is con is, is where all layers of the belly are condensed, and it's actually attached yeah. to the inside of your belly. So it, it's not mobile. No, no. <laughs> like yeah, in a real, like the end of a breast, that is stuck to that part. It, of it's the highly belly. attached. And also, yeah, I'm told attached. you can't get into heaven without one. Ah, that's what Good. Dr. Puckett used to say. So <laughs> anyway, so I keep going, and I don't stop until I get to the xiphoid process in the ribs. My so under so you're tunneling all the way. To the ribs. Oh my, so you're separating the entire it's just, belly wall. It's just a skinny, yeah, skinny fat. And then we, this is how I cheat. I bend the table. Because by bending the table, uh, I can take so more. You, you buckle them a little bit. I buckle them a lot. I bend them in half. Oh my goodness. And because then I can take more and still close them. So you have a special table that does that? Uh, they all do. They all do now. Uh, the well, the OR tables. Gotcha. And so the, the second line, which I, I predict, in pre-op, but I, I don't commit until the OR is now. This isn't wrap around, right? But basically, this right. is like an ellipse. Okay. Th these come down, you know, like a. So point. You're talking about another horizontal incision, kind of curving a, a frowny face incision up top above the belly button, and that whole area of flabby skin is going to come off, huh? Right. All this comes off, and then so like when people are like, well, I don't understand how you're getting all this these rolls out over here. Well, at this move, we're Pulling that down. it and down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so also, a point I make at this point is when I draw this, this line on, on people or on this diagram, like I get it. I know where that incision is, so I know where that scar is going to be. But right. this, if, this was, if I was just going in and taking out her ovaries right. and, and the closing, that is where her scar would be. Right. That's an incision. But this is an excision. I'm making this line as hot, as low as I can make it. I'm making this line as high as I can make it. So in reality, her scar is going to end up like that. Ah, in between. Okay, that Something makes a like lot that. of sense. Everything moves. So it's not a bad thing, but some of this gets raised, and that's usually good, you know, because they're a little totic down here, too. So that's swelling. So it, it, it tightens up even below the incision. So the whole belly is going to get flatter. And I, and I bring this up because ideally you'd want the incision to be hidden behind a bikini or panties or whatever. Right. And often it's just right there. It, it's, it, it's right. You'd like it to be maybe a little lower sometimes. It just depends. But the only way to cheat this line any lower would be to either cheat this line lower, which again takes away farm result. Gotcha. So, so there's um, going to be a, a, a scar. It's going to look 
be a horizontal curvy scar. Yeah. And the belly button, you're going to bring it up to a new hole, aren't you? Well, when I bring this down, I just bring this out through the through where wherever I I sight where it's coming. I make a new hole. So there's a new hole. So you're going to cut a new hole in this, and wherever the belly button sits naturally, it's going to come. Yeah, that's where it comes back out. Relocate. So it's relocated in the skin, but it's not relocated exactly in regards to the the internal organ. The other point to you were talking about the diastasis rectus. Yes. So these rectus muscles are split to give room for the baby. That is a normal. So, way that the female body can if, can hold a baby, and, and and this that's that is what results in that lower abdominal pooch. You know that that even and, real trim ladies that have had a couple of kids. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, and they can't do enough sit ups because it, it, it's, 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 it, 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 there's it's, an opening. There. They're not heavy. They're not overweight. It's not about muscle tone. It's a mechanical disadvantage. So we just tighten this up right here. We we re, so you can reposition sew that those. back together. Yeah. And you can do this in the office. Once again, the same procedure. This is part of the tummy tuck. Right, right. It's, it's an integral part of the tummy tuck. Because you're not going into the organs. You're no. still staying on the outside. So you can do this safely in the office with an anesthetist, minimal blood loss, and it can be a same-day surgery. Exactly, exactly. And, and I don't want to downplay office. It's fully accredited operating room. Oh, it's a real operating room, yeah. I just want to say it's different from the hospital, and you're right. not going to have... Most likely, you know, blood loss issues or anesthesia issues that could be life threatening. So it's a very, I just want to put a fine point on this. This is very safe, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, we go through the same accreditation the hospitals do. Sure. Well, ours is Quad ASF. I, you know, you, you're familiar with these organizations, right? The, uh, uh, I just know they're out there and you got to keep them happy. Well, JCO, we all know that one. That does the big hospitals. Quad ASF is outpatient surgical centers. So we, okay. we do the same accreditation. I mean, our OR has everything any other OR would have, the crash cart, all that stuff. So, I mean, anything else would be would be not a good idea. So you want, if you're having a plastic surgeon do this, you want them to be fully accredited. And if you were to go out of the country, for example, it might not be. Let's say Well, no, it wouldn't be. It can't south, be outside of the country. South, south of a border. Um, I have... A, Patients that sometimes have gone south of the border for reproductive surgery. Sometimes they do an okay job, but most of the time I've got, I've, it's a redo. I'm trying to trying to fix the damage or the substandard work. That was I hear also. horror stories all the time. I have, I have some friends, yeah. I mean, like San Antonio, places that are, I mean, basically. Right on the border, yeah. Uh, they, I'm sure there's good providers over there, I know, but there's no right. follow-up. And so right. that's the danger. Right. If they have a problem, they got to come to me. Well, <laughs> honestly, I mean, I, one, of my, one of my trainees, one of the guys I trained was, was telling me how horrible he says, these people show up in the ER. And I'm like, man, this does not sound like your problem. You know, I mean, I just don't feel like that. Why would that be his problem? But it's, uh, that's all rough on another whole tangent. Well, I just want to say this, Matt. You get what you pay for. I think that's true. You get what you pay for. And this is where I think an investment. Well, here's here, here's maybe a, maybe where the disconnect is. You know, okay. we're so used to, I want a toaster. You know, like what kind of I'm gonna get a mana. Okay, I'm gonna get a mana toaster. You're online. I can get it at Walmart. I get it here. I get it here. Right. Same thing, different prices. Right. Surgery is not same thing, different prices. It's not. So it it, it involves a lot of different things. You have to have a good rapport with your surgeon. You should have a good rapport with your surgeon. That got you know the, that person's gonna be taking care of you. You're entrusting them with a lot. And and also all the stuff that goes along with it, their training and their background experience and stuff. Yeah, you really need to have that. So, you do much facial work? Do you still do um, neck lifts or facelifts, Matt? You know, on the books, yeah. But I'm, you know, I, I, I'm sort of getting. I, I'm, I'm. My practice is. I'm in the twilight of my career. I think. Sure. I, mean, I uh, people I've trained are already retiring. I don't know that. Ah. I'll, I don't know that I'll ever quit. I mean, voluntarily, but uh, nice. I'm down to three days a week. So yeah. our, you know, really, like for example, I've never done rhinoplasty, so I've never done that nose job. So I'm not going to ask you about nose job because I, I see you, 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 you see a person who's had a nose job, a rhinoplasty, and you can tell just like bad breast well, work, a bad nose job, it's is right just front a disaster. and center. Right? And I was trained to do them. You know, I'm allowed to do them. But I felt like, you know, who, why would I do that? I mean, I'm not doing anyone any favors. Right. I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather do stuff that I'm good at, you know. Good so, and I'm not 
I'm not doing, I, I, we're doing so much breast and so much tummy and, and other stuff. The facelift, I really haven't, I probably am, am not doing so much of that at all. So I could fairly, I should, I can safely say you should go to somebody that does a lot of them. In anything. In anything. In anything, in anything you should what do that. What are they good at? What do they do? Right. All the time. So let's talk about the other half of your practice, Matt, which is reconstruction from traumas and whatnot. Now, did you tell me that there was a, a young woman that had her heart, her hand had fallen out of a car during an accident? She was driving. She was she, she was, was six. She, she was sixteen. Oh my goodness! Sweet girl, we're still Facebook friends. I, I'll, I'll send her a link to this. But uh, she was sixteen, and she came in my clinic. And what had happened? It was a devastating injury. She which she was in an ambulance. Did she walk in? No, she 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 walked in. Yeah, yeah. She walked. This was in. this was. I didn't see her acutely. She she I can't remember exactly what happened. She went somewhere else, and they didn't take her insurance or something. I, I don't know the deal. Oh my goodness! But it wasn't. It wasn't like an ambulance. I met her in my clinic. But she had a profound injury to yeah. her hand. Yeah. What kind of injury did she have? She basically scraped off all the skin and the and the tendons on the on the back of several fingers. Wow. So could not actively extend because that's what the tendons on the back so of the So just explain to everybody at home that when you flex or bend a finger, there's two tendons here, if I remember, that go to your forearm that flex. And then there's a tendon on the other side, goes to this other side of your forearm that extends. extends it. So you have to be able to flex and extend right. to have finger motion. And it was, it was, uh, this is a hard problem uh, because uh, you can't just put in a, a cord, like a tendon graft, to like connect here to here to replace that. Because the way God brilliantly engineered our hands, yeah. that if we had just a cord here, I wouldn't be able to bend it because it would tether. It, it would, but what our tendons do, right? Our tendons, our extensor tendons falls to the side when we ah, when we flex. Ah, fascinating. Okay, so the tendon, this dorsal extensor tendon, to use the medical term, splits to the sides. You couldn't just graft a, a, a part there. No, no, you couldn't. And in fact, we had three levels, you know, several levels to reconstruct. We had to reconstruct the the uh, tendon and also get her closed over it too. And I imagine there's grime and grit and sand and gravel and uh, like motorcycle injuries they I, grind I, into I'm sure I have pavement. a picture I'm sure I have the pictures if you wanted to add one into the, the post no <laughs> yeah, it'll be the links below right, Hunter's right. going no 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 all um, right so it was a horrible injury so what did you do Matt I invented a surgery for that one I love it so I took a I took tendons there's tendons we could take on our body that are that are extra Okay. Like palmaris longus here doesn't have any function. This is a pretty good tendon. We have plantaris tendons in our legs. So uh, I took tendon grafts and I made it into a V. So I basically went here to here to here so that when she bent, it would fall to the side like, like our oh normal tendons do. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, and it didn't get infected. You were able to put that in yeah. and close it over, clean it up, give her antibiotics. She went on. She was the catcher. She was the catcher of her high school high school uh, softball team. They won Af state. Afterwards. Afterwards, yeah. So after this injury, she gained function. She could play softball. Yeah. Unbelievable. I have, I have pictures still in my office of her. Uh, she was, I guess it was some kind of dance or prom. She was in a cast. And she's like in her prom dress, hiding her cast behind her. But from, a different, see, from a different injury? No, no. no from, from, from my recovery, from my surgery. So she was healing from your surgery, had a cast and everything. It went, went to the dance. But she was in the dance with a healing hand yeah. and she's, that would become functional. She's a mother of a beautiful girl, and she's an athletic trainer now. That's just fantastic. So you, you, you used your talents and your imagination and your training and were able to put – because every surgery is different. I mean, they're, they're, Many ways they're the same, but everyone's a little different, aren't they? Well, I'll tell you what. My, my biggest – the biggest – uh, the the biggest insult I could throw at a at any other plastic surgeon would be that they lack imagination, and ah. and you know for for plastic surgeons I think this is just me but I think it's the right way to think about it. We we're always thinking of Plan B and Plan C. I mean, if this doesn't work, ah. then what? You know, and you have to have this worked out in advance. You know, in the OR or whatever. So you're thinking of different contingencies and and whatnot in terms of how to how to deal with something. Okay. So when you're when you're trained as a as a Plastic surgeon, 
we have all these we have all these techniques. You know, you learn how to skin graft, you learn how to bone graft, you learn how to do a tendon repair. You know, you these are like the Lego blocks, and then you take these Lego blocks and you build a castle with it. You gotcha. just, you, you consolidate this this skill and this skill and this skill from over here, and then you co put them all together in a in an operation. And that's why some of your training involves general surgery for a little while too, doesn't it? Before well, that was just advanced pain and suffering. <laughs> they back in the day you i mean they wanted you to do five years of general surgery full before, general surgery yeah. i didn't do that i was i was one of the first people to to just i just threw the dice when i when i signed up for general surgery i was like look i'm not gonna do five years all the programs were pyramidal back then right right well let me explain pyramids folks yeah this these this, were brutal you'd be have the, all these these first year intern residents call it in 12, 12 interns one chief resident five years later. So you were the backstabbing. So you, they got you slave labor and the stress on these poor people to finally be the, yeah. the, the chief. And so, so obviously the general surgery program was interested in people who would be bodies for a certain period of time and who not have to leave. worry about Wouldn't that. have to pyramid up. And, and then there, there's people in that group that are going to go on to urology, which is two years, and ortho, which is one year, and neurosurgery, which is one year. Okay. And I just said, you know, Mike Messler, who is the uh, program director, I was like, I'll, look, I'll do three years. Okay. And you don't have to worry about, you know, I don't want to do any more. Right. But it was a real, it was a real toss of the dice for me because I had to find a plan. There's nothing you can do with three years of general surgery. I mean, you can work right. in the ER, maybe, back in the day. Right. right. But, uh, but I, I, I had to secure a plastic spot later. Uh -huh. and, and otherwise, and so fortunately, I was able to do that. So three years was the minimum. Oh, so I, I was just pointing that that you have to be a a surgeon, <laughs> big big ass surgeon. You got to be able to a surgeon of of the human body. You know how to handle all the things that come along with it. And then you become more and more specialized. You know, right. For example, in the plastic surgery. So do do you also take care of uh, other traumas or limb limb detachments or well replants? I mean uh, replants. Right. That's that. That was. We do that all the time. That's my technically my my fellowship is hand and microsurgery, and so um, ah, so you would reattach fingers and whatnot. Fingers, hands, arms. Wow, you can reattach an arm, Matt. I've done two. <laughs> Please tell me. Fortunately, they're very rare. But uh, there was I was one day one one Saturday morning. I, I was over at Ellis. There was like when Ellis was a thing. That was a can That was a cancer a, a hospital. Can, a cancer hospital. You were in. And I was I was the I was the Plastics head of Ellis, you know, plastics. Okay. And there was some kind of reception, you know, and but it was in the morning, and we got a call from Boonville that they were life lighting an eight year old girl with her arm off. Eight year old girl. How did she have her arm they, amputated? They were coming from Arkansas. They were heading to Worlds of Fun, and they. So that's an amusement park in the Kansas City area. Yeah. Okay. And their seventeen year old sister was driving, and uh, mom, dad, brother. And sister, so sister and mom died at the scene. It was a horrible car crash, like on the interstate, maybe. maybe yeah, yeah, seventy on on uh, Route seventy on the interstate. Horrible car crash and uh, lost family members. And they they life flighted her straight from the scene to Mizzou, and uh, we just took her straight to the operating room and uh, put it back together. And uh, so it, they brought the limb with her. It was about at this level. Uh, mid or mid humors. mid uh, mid humors mid upper arm, and they put this on ice, or they just threw it in a bag. And well, I yeah, technically, I, mean, I don't know how much ice is on the helicopter, but you, it was eight minutes. So it, okay, but so it but it definitely the, the the difference between a finger and an arm. An arm is very frightening to me because there's all kinds of muscle here, and it's now ischemic, and you know, needs no oxygen, no, no blood, blood flow, no oxygen. And the problem is when oxygen comes back, that's something called reperfusion, and there's a massive dump of toxic metabolites into the system. Okay. So um, anyway, I mean, so by analogy, if I cut, if someone cuts off a finger, you have 36 hours to get that thing back on. It can sit in a really? fridge. Really? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, oh, I mean, I'm learning so much from you. Not Matt. many people will probably do that, but it's in the literature of solid that you you don't. It's not a big rush because. There's nothing here that's really metabolically active. Right. I mean, there's right. bone and skin, but it can tolerate right. it. It can tolerate. Okay. But uh, tendon. 
But so anyway, oh, this was muscle. I can't remember exactly what her ischemic time was, but that was that was the uh, the f- first we get the bone connected, and then to stabilize it. But we have we we're you searching clean it up, stabilize the bone. Well, yeah, those the scaffolding, and then we got to find this stuff. We got to find the artery. We got to find the, the radial nerve. The, got to find they, these are not clean cuts. These are traumatic injuries. It's well, it it was. It wasn't a, it wasn't like a knife, but it was it was pretty clean. But yeah, it's it's basically evolved to, to a degree, and uh, so you got to find the you know they're they're all retracted back into the into the you limb or up find in here. The arteries and veins. You got to find the artery first, right? Yep, yep. Because that gets artery that gets blood in, okay. and then we let the clamps off and did the vein, but they were just letting it bleed, you know. You can find them actually. And so uh, you were able to reattach this young girl's arm. Mm-hmm. And how did she? How did she do after? Well, this? Uh, they were from Arkansas, and right. and uh, I didn't, uh, you know, the the mother. I mean, it was a devastating thing for right. our family. Family members are dead. The, oh my the, goodness! The dad was just a great guy. He, you know, but he was ho- trying to hold this, hold everyone together here. They had a, a son and a daughter, and he was severely injured too. No, but they got a scratch on him. I'll be darned. Uh, son had a little cut on his head, but they were seat belted. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, the uh, I saw I got her I saw her one time for follow up at six months, and I have pictures of her where she could extend her fingers and, and flex them, and I was like, holy! God. And, and the the lesson for me there is, I mean, if they did that on a guy my age, it would it would not work at all. Kids she was are eight. Kids are so amazing in their plasticity and, and stem cell germ whatever cells. it is. And you were able to reattach the nerve I to did. some degree. You've got all these things together, artery, vein, nerve, and bone, and you saved her limb. And she is also one of my Facebook friends still, and ah. she uh, she has a mess of kids. I think at least three. She lives in California. So. Oh, isn't that heartwarming? And you wouldn't think, uh, I wouldn't think of plastic surgeons necessarily as uh, as trauma or reattachment surgeons, but given your... Your your training, microsurgery, hand clearly your your very important part of that team. Well, you know, honestly, I, I always felt like plastic surgery was like the surgeon surgeon. You know, we took care of everybody's complications. You know, uh, cardiothoracic has a sternal wound dehiscence. Right. We took care of that. We took care of that for, for them with flaps uh, or whatnot. Uh, if in you know, this, we're able to go anywhere in the body, which is kind yeah. of one of the things that I liked about it when I like. When I was, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. Actually, when I was right as an M3, I was kind of torn between neurosurgery and plastic surgery. That's a medical student when you have to start making some decisions. Yeah. Your trajectory. Sorry, I'm, I'm speaking That's in right, code. I'll translate. I'll translate. But uh, thank God I didn't go neurosurgery. But anyway, the thing about plastic surgery was really, I mean, I could have on a schedule, I could work on a face, do a mandible fracture, uh, eyelid surgery. I could do a hand fracture, carpal tunnel release, tummy tuck. Flap on the leg, save a save wow. a cover hardware. We're all over the body. Never a boring day. No, no. It's and it's it's honestly it's a lot of it's a lot of fun if you do it right. Now, do you do any cosmetic surgery of the genitals? Labioplasty. Labioplasty. So some women, I'm just going to say, being an, an OBGYN by training, I say some women are asymmetrical. One side's bigger than the other, bigger than you like. There's damage from childbirth or. Or something like that. Honestly, you know, this wasn't really much called for, you know, when I was training in the '80s. But fashions have changed, you know, and now uh-huh. now there's less hair hiding that, right, right. And so there are a lot more, and there's a lot more consciousness about there's it. A lot of selfies and stuff. Everybody has a camera. And and we all they have want to, to compare themselves to each other. So there's some women that are unhappy with with their appearance of mm-hmm. their genitals here. You can actually do labioplasties and 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 create create a situation that where they're happier. Ba- yeah, basically the labia minora is that inner the inner lips, I guess. Okay. And um, what I can help with is if they're like floppy and because uh, they can excess. get caught in their in, in their clothing and they're riding bikes and exercise, and, yeah, and spinning and it, it's, it's irritating. So we can we can trim that back, but okay. that that's the extent of what I do. With, uh, with general surgery. Because I tell you, cosmetic GYN is a whole thing. There are just, there's you know, people in the OBG in the GYN world that do just that. Yeah. You know, they have clinics and people fly there for, for all kinds of vulvar surgery work. But, but even so, you, 
and do the whole body, including uh, the genital area. So if a young woman has an issue there, she can certainly come to you for an opinion and right, you can right. help her. Yeah. All right, fantastic. Well, are there any other areas of your work that I haven't covered that, that you find particularly exciting or rewarding? Or have we covered the major areas where, where you can get uh, uh, surgery at Concanon? In terms of in terms of what's rewarding is it's it's the believe it or not it's it's the relationships you know sure uh, you know what I'm talking about oh I've got baby I've got six thousand baby pictures on my walls so right this is, we don't do this just to, as a job we do this as a call it's really it's and I, I, as a as a vocation right. I feel so freaking lucky I just yeah. feel so lucky we are blessed to be able to, to do this to, I, because I've never felt I never feel like I'm going to work. Maybe a couple times, you know. When yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I got to do this case. Right. I don't want to do this case, but but right. uh, but for it, the most part, you know, the the people. I'll I'll share another story. Please. Um, there's a. Uh, I was I was at the university. Uh, I was at the university for twelve years uh, as program director before I went into private practice in two thousand seven. But anyway, um, there was a lady who uh, was a, she was nine months pregnant, and she was involved in a in. I don't know if she had to be ejected from this car. Oh. And she scraped this much of her of her scalp off. So it's gone. There's, it's I'm, it's not an incision. It is a I'm, I'm, a worn off spot. I'm seeing skull, skull. with gravel. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, all the dirt and all the stuff on the road. No, she the That's gravel straight. dug lines into her skull. Oh, it, it made lines, and it was about this big. Oh my goodness! And I'm thinking, how the heck? Because you can't graft that. And she's pregnant. Yeah, she was pregnant. And you better so, keep the pregnancy alive. So the first thing is, yeah, she was an SICU, which is our intensive care unit, initially, and and so basically we just this temporary just, just did local wound you care, dress it, let her have her baby. Okay. Who now I think is a nurse. Her baby I think is a nurse now. Right. I, I just she's got she's got a bunch of babies and grandbabies. They're all beautiful. Yeah. But anyway, um, she, uh, but, so she's in my clinic now. We're trying to figure out what to do. So what I ended up doing is I cut a flap all the way down to her eyebrow on the uninjured side, all the way down like this. Her whole, I, I basically elevated the whole tongue of her remaining scalp over here uh -huh. and flipped it over here to cover that bone. But I left the periosteum over here on her forehead and the scalp. Yeah. I put a full thickness skin graft on her forehead. On the uninjured side that would accept a graft. They accept a graft. Without all the gravel right. and dirt. Right. Yeah. Well, the, 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 all the gravel and dirt was gone by this time. As but, best you can. But, but you, can't graft, hamburger. you can't graft you can't graft bare bone. It was just dry bone. So um, so we skin grafted the forehead with a full thickness skin graft and split the skin graft up here. The diff difference, difference being, you know, we don't have that much donor for full thickness skin graft. There's not that much. We, we, a full Where'd thickness. Where did you take it from? Uh, groin. Groin. Yeah. So basically, you can cut an not ellipse. Not the buttock. No, no. I get more groin. from the groin. So you can take a, an ellipse of full thickness, but with a full thickness, you have to close it, right? Okay. With, a, with a split thickness, you just shave off the. Yeah, it, it's a it's a power tool. It goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't have that much full thickness, but so I use that for the forehead because that's what you're going to see. And then the split thickness skin graft we use back here, which is even better. Because split the skin graft as it heals, it contracts. So it pulled everything in a little bit, so it made the actual spot smaller. So she has like a strip right here. It's just, it's like almost, it's not a comb over, but your hair just covers it completely. Gotcha. Anyway, this was, you know, 20 years ago. And I, I just, I see her, I, I saw her at, uh, oh, that steak place over by, um, Local restaurant. Local restaurant. I, I saw her and I, and I went over and, and said, hey, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to eat here. And just got, <laughs> got a big hug. And uh, she's, uh, she's just part of the family, you know. Yeah. And she got. And once again, you have to use imagine. You have to know the anatomy. You have to have the training. And you have to have the imagination to make these flaps and to see it. It is artwork, Matt. That one I'm pretty proud of because I think yeah. most people would have just, you know, would have just stuck a flap on it. Like a like a, a latissimus muscle, just put it up there okay. and put a you know made a big piece of meat, but it wasn't going to do anything for you know for solving the rest of her forehead problems. I mean, it came all the way down to here. So anyway, 
I was pretty proud of how that turned out. She looks pretty good, man. This is great. Ah, that's fantastic. <laughs> so rewarding. Well, Matt, thank you so much. I have learned so much in this discussion. I have a real new appreciation for what you do. Um, it's a pleasure to call you a colleague. It's wonderful to have you as a talented resource here in central Missouri. And I really appreciate you spending the time with us to help our uh, our audience learn. Well, more thanks about for thanks for inviting surgery. me. It was, it was a lot of fun. What a pleasure. Maybe we'll have you back sometime. I'll try and come up with more stories. Thank you, Matt. All right, nice seeing you. You too, my friend.